Let me briefly reiterate what Pastor Trey said in the announcements. Our Kids Jam sign-ups are a little bit behind for this time of the year, and we cannot do this without you. I will not be offended if you take a few moments now and pull out your phone and get on the New Life app and go ahead and sign up for that. We appreciate all of your help. I used to be a much bigger baseball fan than I am now. It's just one of those things that over the years, I just don't take the time to watch baseball games. But as I followed Anita around the country as she was serving in the Navy, we were always fans of whatever the hometown team was. Back in the 90s, the mid-90s, we were in San Diego, so I was a big San Diego Padres fan. And that was the period of time, 96, 97, 98, that San Diego was having some great success. They went to the World Series in 1998, although they lost to the Yankees in four games. I was in the stands when they won the uh, National League Championship game years before. Uh, 1996, they went to the playoffs as well. They had an all-star third baseman. His name was Ken Caminetti, one of my favorite baseball players. He's just, you know, he just absolutely gave it 110% uh, every, every single game. From 95 through 97, he won three straight gold glove awards. In 96, he set the new Padres record for most runs batted in in a year, and that record still stands today. He was also just the fifth person to be unanimously selected as the National League MVP in 1996, and he did all of that uh, in spite of playing most of that season with a torn rotator cuff. He just really... Uh, just gave it his all, and I admired him for that. That was something that I learned from my dad growing up, that whatever you do, give it 110%, and he did. I remember one series in 96, it was at a time where they were actually going down to Mexico City and, and playing some games, and he got down there. Cammy got food poisoning, and he was so sick, so weak, that before the game, they carried him into the locker room, laid him down on a concrete floor, and strung an IV from a coat hanger to give him two liters of fluid. But by the time the manager went out to give the umpires the starting lineup, he was coming out of the clubhouse and saying, Coach, I'm ready to play. He goes out into the game. It wasn't too long before he comes up for his first at bat, He's still feeling somewhat neat or somewhat weak. He walks up to the plate eating a Snickers bar for a little bit more energy before he knocked the first of two home runs in that game, and he scored half of the Padres' eight runs in that game. When he returned to San Diego from there on out, he would go out on the field and the fans would throw Snickers bars down on the field. He's just that kind of impact player. He was what they called a game changer. When he walked onto the field, you expected great things to happen. I admired him for that. I admired him even more because I knew that from his time with the Houston Astros before he came to San Diego, he was battling uh, alcohol addiction, and in 1994, he had gone into rehab and treatment for alcohol addiction, and it seemed like he had overcome, and in, the, in his mid-30s, which is starting to get older for a baseball player, he was having some of the best seasons in his life, both on and off the field. By all appearances, it looked like he was headed for a lifetime of success. 2001 was his last year as, as a ball player. He split, split the year uh, between Texas and the Atlanta Braves, finished up the season with the Braves, but they didn't include him on their 
playoff roster because by that point he just had so many injuries that he just wasn't able to overcome them. Two months later, he was arrested for cocaine possession for the first time. By the fall of 2004, three years later, he'd failed another three drug tests. His wife had left him and gotten divorced. He found himself in a jail in Texas once again. And five days after getting out of jail, he decided to take a trip to New York City. He had a friend of his whose son was addicted to drugs. And Cammie was always one to try to help out people who, that, who were hurting. And he thought that if he went to New York, that he'd be able to make a difference. That if he got there, that, that he would be able to, to see that young man get in to rehab. But as all too often happens when people with an addictive lifestyle go out and try to help other people, uh, the temptation was too great for him. He wound up calling his drug dealer. Several days later, he dropped dead of heart failure, but the primary cause of his death was overdose of cocaine mixed with heroin. A tragic end to uh, a 40-ish life that, that, that had such potential. His agent said this, every hero has his fatal flaws, whether it's an Achilles heel or kryptonite, the guy was so strong and determined on the baseball field, but he was never able to carry it off the field. I don't know why. We'll never know why. Perhaps he was never able to carry it over on, off the field because this was just one thing that he simply could not do under his own will and his own determination that he needed more than that. I met him at an autograph signing in 1996. I've still got a picture in my living room of us together at his home, or at, or at the uh, autograph signing It's in my home, in our living room. And in my office, I've got a poster of him sitting on a really nice motorcycle. And it, it's autographed. The autograph by now is completely faded. It's, it's worthless to anyone but me. But I keep it there for several reasons. One, to remind me of a, a really enjoyable time in life. It was just so awesome to be a part of a championship city and just be able to go out and watch the games and, and, and just see the grit and determination on the ball field. So, I mean, it, it was a good time. But every time I look at it, I'm reminded of the tragedy of a life cut short. It's a chilling reminder of the dangers of, of sin and addiction and the places that that will take you. If you turn to chapter 6 in the book of Judges, we'll find the story of, of a man that was rather ordinary, rather unassuming. His name was Gideon. He was an impact player. He was a game changer. It was not long after we're introduced to Gideon that God uses him to do some great things. He had an immediate impact on his family, on his village, for the nation of Israel as a whole. But by now, you should have figured out that these stories of these judges, we're not studying them. They're not given to us as a great moral example to follow because each of these men were flawed sinful human beings, and Gideon was no different. In fact, as we start reading through the book of Judges with each successive judge, the cycle becomes somewhat worse. By the time we get to Gideon, he starts exceptionally well, but for the first time, even before his death, the nation has already headed back into disobedience to God and idol worship, uh, partially because of the actions of Gideon himself. So as Pastor Trey reminded us last week, he touched on this, I don't want us to forget it, 
we need to make sure that when we look at the lives of these characters, we look at Gideon this week, we look at Samson next week, this greater cycle of sin, oppression, the people crying out to God, God sending a deliverer and salvation, this ongoing cycle uh, is portrayed on a smaller level in the lives of each of these judges. They all had the potential to break the cycle, but somewhere along the way, the fatal flaws in their lives caused them to stumble so that following their deaths, the nation returned once again to doing what was right in their own eyes and what was evil in the sight of God. This morning, I want us to take, at, take a look at just three stages of Gideon's life. It's chapter 6 through chapter 8. There's so much there that we can't talk about anywhere near all of it. But the three stages I want to talk about, I'll give you up front. The call, the conquest, the compromise. And from each of those stages, I just want to draw out for us a, a key that we could use for a lifetime of success. Because that's what Gideon could have had. That's what Gideon should have had, is a lifetime of success. And so hopefully these keys will help us break cycles of sin and, and live a lifetime of success. The first one is this, the first key to a lifetime of success, answer the call. Starting in Judges chapter 6, verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Bezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? He said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Where does the Lord find Gideon? Hiding out in a wine press, trying to thresh the grain, trying to beat the grain, beat the wheat out of the or beat the grain out of the wheat and hide it from the Midianites who year after year, season after season, for seven years have came down against Israel and stolen all the produce. The people are starving. Gideon's not where he's supposed to be. Normally, grain would have been threshed out, beaten out, up on a hilltop so that when they threw the plants and the grain and the chaff into the air, the wind carried the chaff and the straw away and would leave the grain. He's down in a wine press where there wouldn't have been any air stirring or not very, uh, li or very little. He only had two choices. One, wait for an extremely windy day and hope that as he threw the grain and the plants and the straw up into the air, that the wind would be able to carry it away and leave the grain. Or he would have to scoop up the plants, the wheat, the chaff, the grain, all of it, and carry it to an open area higher up so that he could throw it into the air, all the while escaping from hiding from, not being caught, not having the produce stolen by the Midianites. That's, those things aren't things that I think of when I think of a mighty man of valor. He's hiding out. Warren Wiersbe said at this stage of his life, it was Gideon the coward. But that's not the way the Lord addressed Gideon because the Lord has the power and the ability to see what Gideon's life would be like, can be like, to see his potential 
when divinely enabled to carry out God's plan for his life. He wasn't where he was supposed to be, but the Lord didn't have to go looking for him. He knew exactly where he was. He knew exactly where he was physically. He knew exactly where he was spiritually. There's no hiding from God. The Lord knew that Gideon and his family had erected the idols at their house and were worshiping the foreign gods. He knew everything that was going on in his life, but how does the Lord answer? Uh, how does Gideon respond to the angel of the Lord? With excuses. Often the way we do, with complaints, with questions. Why is this happening to me? This is all about me. Lord, why are you doing this to us? Why are we suffering? Why didn't you save us? What can I do to deliver Israel? Clearly, he had knowledge of who God was. He had head knowledge. He grew up learning about who the Lord was, and all that the Lord had accomplished. He knew that the Lord had brought the people of Israel out of slavery, up out of Egypt. He knew that he had, the Lord had delivered them into the promised land and gone before them and, and driven out enemies. But he'd conveniently forgotten that the Lord's promises to the nation of Israel were conditional upon the performance of the Israelites. He had told them, if you follow my law, if you obey my commands, it will go well with you. If you don't follow my law and follow my commands, if you're not obedient, it will not go well with you. Gideon had forgotten that and went to the Lord blaming them while failing to remember that it's Israel that's failed the test. Israel has been turned over to the hand of the Midianites because of their failure to worship the Lord. But the Lord didn't bring any of that up to Gideon. He didn't argue with Gideon. He didn't remind Gideon of his shortcomings. Gideon and the people, they'd cried out to the Lord, and, and the Lord visited when you cry out to the Lord, it's not God's plan and intent to beat you up and remind you of all the ways that, you're fa that you failed. The Lord comes and he says, Gideon, I'm with you. The Lord is with you. I will be with you. You obey me. You follow me. I will be with you. You will be victorious. I'm all you ever need. Are you ready to answer the call? I've got a love-hate relationship with cell phones. I find that they're great. You know, when I was younger growing up, if I was away from home or the person I wanted to talk to wasn't at home, I had to wait for them to get there. There weren't even answering machines. You just had to keep on calling until you happened to get somebody at home. But now I have a reasonable expect, expectation that everybody that I know, with the exception of a few small children, has a, has a mobile phone. So I should be able to get anyone on the phone just about any time that I need to. That They're going to answer the phone. They're going to see Eric Sasser come up on their screen, and they're going to go, huh, Eric doesn't like talking on the phone. Eric is calling me. He probably needs me. I should answer the phone. That's the way I treat phone calls. I ignore the hundreds of robocalls every day, the spam calls every day, all the other junk. But when someone I know, when their name comes up on the phone, 99.9% .9 of the time I'm going to answer because I know that that person is calling me for a reason. You know the number one person who doesn't answer my calls? my wife. And I don't understand why that is. Because I know my wife, I, I know why it is, but my wife, she is like me. She doesn't like to spend time on the phone. She knows I don't like to spend time on the phone. If she sees my name on the phone, she knows I'm not just calling her to chit-chat. 
I need her right then for something. I need to tell her something. I need some information from her. But she's got the ringer off. She doesn't like to hear the phone ring. She doesn't like to be disturbed by the phone. Most of the time, she's not paying attention to the phone. So 85% of the time, I leave a message on an answering machine and send text until she responds to me because she's not listening. God knows your phone number. He knows exactly where to find you. He knows where you are physically. He knows where you are spiritually. He knows every single thing that's going on in your life. He's ready, willing, and desires to meet you exactly where you are. He calls, come to me. But are you listening? Do you recognize the number? Are you paying attention or are you simply ignoring the call? If you don't even recognize the number, salvation is the first call that you need to answer. It's God's desire that we would all know and have a relationship with Him. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. It's a call to a personal relationship. You will never experience a lifetime of success apart from a relationship with Christ. You've already answered that call. You've experienced salvation. You have a relationship with Christ. The second call is a call to give you purpose. Like Gideon, God has a plan for your life. Romans 8, 28, 29, we know that for those who are called or for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. God's ultimate purpose for you and for your life is to conform you in the image of His Son. So that whatever you, get, whatever you do, wherever you go, you are reflecting Christ to those around you. Starting with your home. Dads, dads-to-be, hear this. Your home is your primary and most important mission field. Don't lose sight of that. Second only to Christ you're called to be the spiritual leader of your household. There is no doubt about that. It's your role to set the godly example for your family so that as your children grow older, they follow you to follow Christ. Children follow our example, positive and negative. Lead your children to a knowledge of who Jesus is and into a relationship with them so that they'll answer that call. The third call is a call to a people. It's a call to be a part of the church. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. As followers of Christ, we're designed to be in fellowship with each other, with other believers. We're designed to be a part of the community of the church, complement one another, use our gifts to serve one another, and build up this body of Christ. We're designed to be a part of a church that goes out to our schools and our workplaces and our communities and shows other people the love and the knowledge of who Jesus is, proclaiming the excellencies of the one who has called us out of darkness and into his light. If you want to experience a lifetime of success, 
You need to answer the call, number one. Number two, anticipate the conquest. When you do what God says do the way that God says to do it, you can anticipate the conquest. You can expect the victory that in God's time, you will be victorious. That may not happen overnight. It may take time, but God will win the battle. Not on your strength, not on your skill, not on your might, not on anything that you can do. Gideon, in his own words, had nothing to bring to the table. There was nothing that he could do. All he had to offer God was his obedience. I'm reminded of something that I learned very on, early on. God doesn't a call the equipped. He equips those that he called for his purposes. So that same night, shortly after his private encounter with the Lord, the Lord had the first assignment, the first test of his faith. Judges chapter 6, verses 25 and 26 Take your father's bull and the second bull seven years old. Pull down the altar of Baal that your father has. Cut down the Asherah that is beside it. Build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you cut down. You can't expect God to fight and win your battles if you're worshiping at the altar of other gods. God fights your battles when you do God's things, God's way, in God's time, and you're worshiping Him. Gideon's family was actively participating in, possibly even leading the village in, worshiping the god Baal and the goddess Asherah. The Asherah that he cut down was likely a carved wooden image of the goddess planted into ground beside the altar. Gideon, you tear down the altar, you cut down the Asherah, you build a new altar to the Lord, you tear down the old, you build up the new, you take the wood from the Asherah, make a fire, and then take the other bull, your father's prime bull, sacrifice him on the altar. That bull was a precious commodity because we've already read that the Midianites continued to come down and they, and they went away with all of the livestock and all of the cattle that they could find. The people were starving. Yet take this thing that is very valuable to your household and give it over to the Lord and entrust it to Him. There's a reason that the first two commandments are you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall have or make no idols. Breaking any of the other commandments begins with or follows from worshiping other gods and erecting idols in your life. Because whenever we redirect our worship, whenever we give worth or value to someone or something other than God, then we're worshiping that thing. We're making an idol of that thing. And if you find in the list of things where you're giving your time and your priority and your worship to, if you find that your relationship with Christ is way on down the list, you may need to rearrange your priorities. How do you determine what those idols are? I could give you a list but I think a little self-reflection is, is a better way to accomplish it. If you don't know what they are right off the top of your head, check your checkbook and your calendar. Where are you spending all your time and all your money? Where are you finding the greatest joy in your life? Where are you spending most of your time or what are you thinking about the most? Those things may well have become idols in your life that need to be torn down. 
And Gideon tore down the altar. He tore down the Asherah in the middle of the night. How do you think uh, his father reacted to that when he comes out the next day? It appears that actually the first people to notice were the villagers because the villagers no- noticed that the altar and the Asherah were gone and they had Joash, his father, come out after they determined that Gideon had torn down the altar and said, you need to deliver Gideon to us. Gideon has to die because he tore down the altar. Dad said, wait a minute. If this Baal that you're worshiping is really a god, if he really has any power, can't he come defend himself? What good's a god if you have to fight his battles for him? And as a matter of fact, if you try to take Gideon and you try to put him to death, you're going to be the ones that die here tonight. A dramatic change in his father. The son has had an effect on the father. The father has seen uh, Gideon's faith, has seen the Lord working in Gideon's life, and that has caused some change and reevaluation and challenged Gideon's father's faith. And he says, We're going to worship the Lord. Dads, families, when you go home on Sunday afternoon, spend time talking to your children about the Lord. I can assure you that your young children next door in kids' life, they're going to come out excited because every week we, we have children that are just, you know, they can't wait to get back to kids' life because of the care that they receive, the Christ-like love that they receive, the good time that they have together. But on top of the good time that they have together, there's a teaching about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them. And if you'll spend some time asking them what they learned, you may learn something from your children. Teenagers in the audience today, it may be up to you to set the example in your family. It may be up to you to have some serious faith conversations with your parents. What a wonderful thing to see a child and a child's faith lead a family to set the example to follow Christ together. Tear down the examples, or tear down the idols. Follow God's instructions. The next thing Gideon did as God continued to instruct, he went out and he called warriors from the surrounding tribes. He called them down to battle. And when they all got down there, the Lord said, the people with you are too many. Pastor Brandon was kind enough to do some math for me in between services. There were approximately 32,000 because it says after they sent home the first 22,000 men with the first test, 10,000 remained. I didn't do the math That's the number of people. They were too many. The Lord set out a series of tests, and he narrowed down the number even farther until it got all the way down to 300. That's it. Gideon, that's all you need. Put away the idols. Follow God's instructions. Now anticipate God's conquest. Again, the Lord spoke to Gideon. One of the things that we didn't have time to talk about Throughout Gideon's story, you see him, when God gives instructions, Gideon often asks for signs that it's really of the Lord. The Lord is patient with Gideon. This time, Gideon didn't ask for a sign, but the Lord gave him one anyway. He said, if you'll go down into the camp of the Midianites, if you don't believe that I've already given you this victory, you go down there, the men in that camp, they've been dreaming about their defeat. And so as Gideon went down and he overheard the people talking of their dreams, they overheard them talking about Gideon coming in victory. Gideon divides the 300 down in down into three companies. He gives each man a weapon. 
Actually, he gives each man a ram's horn or a, or a trumpet for one hand and a jar and a torch for the other. That's it. That's the battle plan. A horn, a jar, a torch. It's hard to believe that all 300 of them didn't just turn and run. What do you mean? That's the battle plan. But as they go into battle together, Judges 7, verses 19 through 21 Gideon and the hundred men that were with him, remember they're divided into three companies. Gideon and his men came to the outskirts of the camp, beginning at the middle of watch, where they had just set the watch. They blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches, and in their right hands the trumpets to blow, and they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp, and the army ran. They cried out, and they fled. So as the armies awakened in the middle of the night from sleep, they hear all of these trumpets blowing. They're surrounded by lights. They have no idea how many people are there. They run off in terror, killing each other along the way as they flee. The victory was already won before Gideon and his men ever showed up. They just had to be available and obedient. I don't know all of the details of the battles that you fight in this auditorium this morning, but I know enough people at New Life and enough stories at New Life and enough of human nature to know what some of them are. There are people in here battling addictions. There are people in here battling sexual sin. There are people in here whose marriages are in trouble. The prospect of divorce is on the horizon. There are families where the children are rebelling against mom and dad. They're rebelling against God. There are families where mom or dad or both have lost jobs. Credit has been overextended. Finances are a wreck. All of these battles are going on. Are you tired of fighting the battle in your own strength? Have you just been trying to do it all on your own? Much like Ken Caminetti and his alcohol and drug addiction, just trying to do it on his own, just trying to do better. You can't do better. You can't just do better. You can't just do differently because eventually you'll lose the will to do better. You have to be a new creation. The only way to be a new creation is through the victory that Jesus has already won on the cross. He took on our sins on a cross. He died a death for us. Three days later arose victorious over death sin, the grave, we've already won. We need to stop living our lives like we've been defeated by all of the things that are going on in our life and going on in the world around us. We need to reflect a life that is victorious in Christ so that the people around us will be encouraged by our example. For the world to see that a relationship with Christ is life-changing we can't do that if we just resemble the world and go on trying to just do better in our own strength. We can anticipate the conquest. Finally, the third key to a successful lifetime, avoid the compromise. Compromise isn't always a bad thing. Anita and I never would have made it through 25 years of marriage without being able to compromise with one another. I love spicy food. Anita loves salt. That's it. Just salt. No spice. All she wants is salt. I use a little, little, bit, little bit less spices when I cook. Anita can add all the salt she wants because I can't stand it. That's our compromise. I like a house that is a little bit cool. I want to be comfortable, especially at night. If it's hot, I cannot sleep. Anita dresses and wants a house 
to be somewhere along the temperature of the seventh level of Hades. I can't stand it. She's the only woman, the only person that I've ever known that's gone on a Caribbean cruise and carried an electric blanket. She sits on our couch bundled up in sweatpants and a hoodie and there's an electric blanket on the bed. And it's July. But we compromise. I allow her to use all of those things, whatever you know the power bill winds up being, I don't care. She can be as warm as she wants with the blanket on her side of her bed, as many as she wants. The temperature of the house is cooler so I can sleep. We can both get along. Compromise isn't a bad thing. It's the way that we get through life together in community. I don't get exactly what I want. You don't get exactly what you want all the time. But together, between the two of us, we come to an agreement that works out to our better most of the time. But you know where Anita and I never compromise. We never compromise on issues of morality and biblical principles or truth. There are places that you have to draw the line. When God says, you shall not, that means you shall not. No means no, yes means yes. So often, well, God will make an exception just for me because I know God wants me to be happy. No, what God wants is for you to be holy. And in holiness, you will find great joy. Don't compromise on biblical principles. You're never going to enjoy a lifetime of success if you do. Compromise didn't just prevent Gideon from enjoying success. It directly led to the next cycle of sin for the nation of Israel. They went right back into the cycle of disobedience. Judges chapter 8 verses 22 through 27. The men of Israel said to Gideon, This is following the the conquest. Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from your spoil." For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak, and every man, in, uh, every man threw in the earrings of his spoil. The weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. That's somewhere around 43 pounds of gold. It's a lot of earrings. Beside the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and beside the collars that were around the necks of the camels, and Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Ophrah, and Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. With the previous judges, it was after the death of the judge where the people turned away from the Lord. In Gideon's case, the slide began before his death as a direct result of him erecting this idol back in the city. Gideon failed to correct the men when they said, You, Gideon, you have saved us from the hand of Midian. After being reminded before the battle that Gideon had too many men and that Israel would likely brag that they had saved themselves so the the men were narrowed down. Here we are after the victory. Gideon, you have saved us. He could have said, should have said, the Lord had saved us. With his words, Gideon said, I will not rule over you. My son will not rule over you. The Lord rules over us. But with his lifestyle... His lifestyle began to resemble very much that of the pagan kings of the nations surrounding them. Again, he didn't say, I am the king. But just as a comparison, if we look back to uh, the book of Deuteronomy and Moses talked about the day was going to come when Israel was going to ask for a king, the Lord said, that's okay, but when that day comes, 
you need to select the man that God has chosen, not a man that the people has chosen. I've got some guidelines for Israel when it comes to selecting a king. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 17 through 19. He, the king, shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of the kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book of this law approved by the Levitical priests. So you will write all of what we know as the first five books of the Old Testament. You will write that by hand for yourself in a book that the priests are going to prove so that you can sit there and read it all the days of your life, be reminded what the Lord says, and keep all the words of the law and the statues and do them. Not just know them, but do them. And Gideon's actions, they spoke louder than his words. He accepted the spoils of war, the gold earrings, the crescent ornaments, the pendants, the purple garments, all worn by the pagan kings. And with that, he made an ephod. Generally, in the Old Testament, ephod is used to refer to a priestly garment that is an outer garment that is worn by the Levitical priests. But in this context, with taking the spoils of war and using them to build the ephod and and reading what other commentaries have to say about what was going on with this ephod, it is most likely that he built some sort of image of an idol of another god and then cloaked it in the purple cloth. So he has built an idol that they carried away and put in the city. And so the people started worshiping that idol right back where they started. Don't take many wives. Wives will turn your heart away from the Lord. Gideon took for himself many wives. The number is not given, but it says that he had 70 sons and then a concubine who was a Canaanite woman from the city of Shechem. The Israelites were not to intermarry with the Canaanite women either, lest they be drawn away to worship their gods. Here Gideon has taken many wives and explicitly gone out and taken a Canaanite woman as his concubine who bore him a son, Abimelech. Abimelech name means the king is my father. Again, Gideon has not necessarily said, hey, I'm the king, but everything that he's doing in life looks to be resembling the lifestyle of the kings of the nations that surround them, and it leads them right back into the cycle of sin. He missed the perfect opportunity to lead a continuing revival in the nation. He could have said, I didn't bring this victory. The Lord did. All I did was I put away the idols. So men, we need to put away all the idols in our household. I followed God's instruction. I was obedient. We have the law. You know the law. What we need to do is be obedient and does and, and do what God says to do. And then we need to go and worship the Lord together. We need to go back to that altar that I erected to the Lord. and We need to worship Him for the victory that He has given us. But he did none of that. He couldn't avoid the compromise. Avoid compromising on biblical principles and moral issues. It's the key to having a lifetime of success. Your past performance doesn't guarantee that. Just because you've committed, you may have committed your life to Christ, the Lord may have done a great thing in your life. He may have done a great thing through you. You may have seen great results in your relationships with other people where people have come to know the Lord. 
But it doesn't matter what you've done, God is still not going to excuse sin. When we reach the place where we get prideful and just cannot believe that we could possibly sin, I would never do that. You should see a big red warning sign. Don't become complacent. Success can lead to a confidence that then leads to compromise and the Lord will punish sin. Don't be complacent if you want to have a lifetime of success. Where are you at this morning? Have you found yourself in one of the stages that God is calling you to salvation or calling you to continuing in discipleship or being a part of the church community? Is there some ongoing cycle of sin that you need to just anticipate that God has already conquered it and just ask for His continuing blessing as you're obedient to Him? Are there idols that you need to put away? Are you in a place of compromise? As we pray together, as we bow our heads, first I want to pray for those who have not yet committed their lives to Christ because that's step one. Without that step, uh, you'll never be able to take the following steps and you're never going to experience a lifetime of success. If that's you, I encourage you to just call out an answer in response to God's call, God drawing you to Him, and say, Lord, I understand that I have sinned against you that it is absolutely impossible for me to do anything to save myself, that the only way to salvation is to commit myself, my life, and entrust my salvation to you and, the compl- and your completed work on the cross. If that's you, we want to celebrate that decision as you entrust your life to Christ and obedience to following Him please let us know through a connection card or an email. God, for the rest of us, whatever stage of life that we're in, God, I pray for encouragement for those who are are caught and seem trapped and seem defeated in a cycle of sin. God, that you'll have the victory, that you will strengthen, encourage, and lead them into Uh, a victorious path as they follow you. God, for those of us who have already been compromised or in a series of compromises, God, we just need you to correct us and move us back to your path and your way. God, I just pray for the strength and encouragement and wisdom. I pray for dads. God, what an awesome responsibility that you've entrusted to us. I pray that you'll raise up godly men in this church, godly dads who will be the spiritual leaders of their household, that they'll teach their children and their wives about the things of God so that as their family grows, they grow in relationship to you and they have children who commit their lives to Christ early. God, avoiding some of the sins and compromises uh, at, that, are, that are often a result of, of having other gods and other relationships. God, I pray for our church that we'll have influence in our community, that our families will have influence in their schools and their workplaces, and we continue to see people uh, come to know you, people that are far from God, commit their life to Christ. And we praise you for that advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Dads, as you head, head out this morning, Make sure that you get a small gift that we've got for you. And I hope you'll all join us again next Sunday as we wrap up this series on the judges. Have a great week.